Good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome once again. So this video is kind of a part two to a previous video that I made where I talked a bit about the 007 Spy Files magazine. And if you're a Bond fan, uh, you know, around the time that I was becoming a Bond fan, around like 2001, 2002, 2003, um, these magazines were on sale and I really loved them. Um, they went through all various different aspects of being James Bond, like skiing, and they went into detail about the characters and so on and so forth. But each issue would come with a pack of 007 fact cards, uh, which are housed in this very attractive deteriorating tin. So in a previous video, I looked at the allies and villains cards. Um, the other categories are Q branch vehicles and locations. And I think that these um, cards are quite interesting because this is a, an officially sanctioned product and the each card gives like ratings. So for example, in villains, we had level of authority, intelligence, identifiable looks, strength, special skills, and evil rating. And as this is an officially sanctioned product, I find it quite interesting to see how, um, how Eon kind of thinks about their characters and some of their, you know, the elements of the James Bond world. So, it was really fun in the previous video going through the allies and the villains and looking at kind of what rating each character had. Um, so now, I'm gonna make my way through the next three categories, which, like I say, Q Branch Vehicles and Locations. Okay, so Q Branch is all about James Bond gadgets, of course. Okay, so number one, we have, of course, the uh, the Walther PPK. Uh, right, so the various categories that we have for Q Branch are cost level, which is amusing. I suppose it is probably very expensive for Q to come up with a lot of these gadgets. So, um, disguise factor, toughness, technology, functions rating, and damaged caused. Um, okay, I, I guess all these kind of make sense. Right, so for the Wolf of PPK, we have cost level 54%. Um, I have no idea how much guns cost. That may be true, that may not be true. I I don't know. Disguise factor 31%. Uh, I, I'd be very curious to meet that other 31% of the population who would look at a Wolf of PPK and think it's a, I think it's a banana or something. I find it interesting that this is, for Bond's signature weapon, this card is quite middling, really. 91% um, for toughness is really good, um, but everything else is kind of functions rating. I don't really know, is that supposed to be like how many functions it has? Because, I mean, yeah, Wolf of PPK, it, it shoots. Like, I don't understand how that gets a 49% function rating. Damage caused 84%. It's nice to know that death only <laughs> rates 84% in these cards. So next up we have the Q Branch Briefcase, um, which is a much stronger card actually than the previous one. Functions rating 98%. I really don't know what functions rating is supposed to be. Is that just kind of like how many functions it has and this gets 98% because it can, you know, hold a sniper and tear gas Irishman? Interesting. Okay, next up we have the Flick Knife Shoes, which this card actually of mine is pretty worn. I think this might have been one of the first cards that I ever got in this set actually, or, or maybe I, I traded it with a friend of mine because this one's a bit more sort of you know, scuffed up than some of my other ones. Again, got a good disguise factor. Um, so this has a pretty good disguise factor. Everything else is a little bit lacking. Um, apparently, cost level 39%. Apparently, getting a flick knife shoe is actually quite cheap. Assuming that cost level means the lower it is, the cheaper it is? Or is it just like value for money? So you're really not getting your value for money from a flick knife shoe, whereas, um, you know, Q Branch briefcase is Pretty good value for money. The Garrow Watch from, from Russia With Love. Okay, so again, not a very... I wonder if any of these cards are going to be terribly spectacular. Like, there were some allies and villains that had really good ratings in so many categories. These all seem a little bit sort of mid-tier for, for the moment. So apparently the Garrow Watch is less disguisable than the Q Branch Briefcase, which is interesting. But it is more technological than Rosa Klebb's Flick Knife Shoe. I'm not quite sure I agree with that. I mean, technology is just a watch with a, you pull it out, whereas with the Flick Knife Shoe, at least it has a little button. Right, next up we have the Razor Rimmed Bowler Hat. I, th I feel like this category should have been um, reclassified as just villain's accoutrement. It seems to be more villain 
uh, gadgets in here than Bond. Okay, but this, this is a pretty good card. Disguise Factor and Toughness are very good. Cost level 36%. Again, not quite sure how we're, how we're judging this. Does this mean that it's expensive to get, to acquire a razor-rimmed bowler hat? Or is it just not good value for money? Because I can't imagine such an artifact would be cheap. Toughness 88%. I mean, it it chops the head off a stone statue. I, I feel like toughness at 88% is actually a bit low for this. Right, next up. Ah, good. Okay, we're back onto, onto Bond gadgets now with the jetpack. Oh, and this is actually quite a good card. Cost level, toughness, and technology are all quite good. Functions rating is low. Um, and damage... Fun how is damage caused 41%? Because that... It doesn't cause any damage, does it? I think it should, should probably be lower than that, because, yeah, huh. Disguise factor 34%. So I like that the jetpack is more disguisable than the wall for PPK. Okay, next up we have, ah, that, that classic gadget that all of the kids, uh, you know, wanted themselves. The safe-cracking copier from Honor Majesty's Secret Service. Despite it being one of the more bland gadgets, it does actually have... A quite above average card, really. Damaged co damage caused 45%. Yeah, oh yeah, it, it caused massive damage. Compare that to the razor rimmed bowler hat, where the damage causes 65%, so there isn't that much difference. In fact, good god, the Grow Watch damage caused is only 56%, so the safe cracking copier almost causes about as much damage as the Grow Watch, like, really. <laughs> I suppose it- I suppose they did need, like, a, a crane to get it into that building, so... I guess if it fell on your head... Ah, the buzzsaw watch. Interesting that they make the distinction that it's a buzzsaw watch. Oh, no, they do mention it, actually. This timepiece cuts through rope and has a magnet strong enough to deflect bullets. Um, but yeah, interesting that they define it by its buzzsaw ability rather than its magnetic ability, which is, I think, the more memorable of the two powers. Technology 85%, like, really? <laughs> It's a magnetic watch with a buzzsaw in it, for goodness sake. I think there's a bit more uh, technological uh, wizardry involved in that than just, yeah, 85%. Ooh, Scaramanga's Golden Gun. Ooh, this is a pretty good card. Yeah, Disguise Factor, 97%. That's really good. Okay, this might actually be the strongest card of the bunch so far, I think it is. Cost level, 94%. So I guess we, it must mean, like, how expensive it is, because a golden gun would be pretty expensive. 94% feels appropriate for that. Damage caused, 84%, just the same as the Wolf of PPK, which is interesting. Okay, next up we have the blade-edged tea tray from The Spy Who Loved Me, which uh, has a remarkably good toughness rating, actually. I'm just checking to see if it's tougher than... Oh no, it's as tough as Odd Job's uh, hat, huh? Ah, Jaws's teeth! Metal fangs as they're referred to here. So toughness, 94%, that's really good. Everything else is a little bit lacking. Uh, damaged cause, 71%. I... I mean, God, it can... It can... He can bite through metal wires with those things and cause instant death. I think damage cost should actually be a bit bigger than that. Wrist Dark Gun from Moonraker, one of my favourite gadgets there. Um, no, it, it's an average card though. Technology 80%, Disguise Factor 82%. That's funny, I would have thought the Disguise Factor for that would actually be quite low, considering it's not like doubling up as, as a watch or anything. Okay, and next is the Spiked Umbrella from For Your Eyes Only. A good disguise factor, pretty poor for everything else. A lot of kind of incidental gadgets included in this selection, which I quite like, because I think some of those Q-Branch scenes where you would just see a gadget for like 30 seconds on screen are some of the more memorable ones. So I, I, I quite like that these cards are paying attention to some of the more, you know, minute gadgets in the series. Yo-Yo Buzzsaw, um, again, has good toughness. I think toughness and disguise factor tend to be the higher ranking of these. Functions rating, I don't know if I've been terribly blown away by any gadget's function rating at the moment. Just scrolling back. Like, what, 85% with the Buzzsaw watch? Oh no, Q-Branch Briefcase 98% has the best function rating. Right, next up we have the Acid Fountain Pen, which is a... 
very much above average card. This is really good. Someone must have liked this gadget to give it this uh, level of scoring. Cost level 69%, disguise factor 90%, technology 88, functions 88, damage caused 61%. Again, this damage caused thing, like what, that causes more damage than... Then what? Almost as much damage as the Blade Edge Tea Tray. Oh my god, brilliant. The Poisoned Butterfly from A View to a Kill. Disguise Factor 95%. Are they having a laugh? Like, even if you think that that butterfly even looks remotely realistic, like, the fact that it comes with a, you know, a... A, a person dressed completely in black holding a, a fishing pole with it dangling from the other end should surely knock down its disguise factor somewhat. Ah, the keyring finder from the Living Daylights is a... Oh yeah, quite a strong card here. Quite expensive though, cost factor 85%. Functions rating 92%, that's a, yeah, very, very solid card. Oh my god, exploding bottles from the Living Daylights, brilliant. Again, that gadget that is, you know, one of the highlights of everyone's memories from The Living Daylights. Damage caused 98%. Wow, I think that that might actually be a winner. Yeah? 98% exploding milk bottles. Okay, Necros had the most uh, damageful uh, gadget of the series up to this point, apparently. Ah, but the Ghetto Blaster is only a 95%. Wow, in damage costs. I thought that one would have been leading, to be honest, in that. But again, a, a pretty good card. One of my uh, favourite sort of background gadgets, actually, is that. Explosive Toothpaste from uh, License to Kill is a... A uh, fairly average card, but damage caused uh, 91% again. Good. Ah, the grenade pen from Goldeneye. Okay, love this one. But the uh, card is okay. 57% uh, cost level. Apparently getting a grenade pen is um, almost half the price of getting a golden gun. Damage is pretty good again with 90%. I guess the damage inflicted by these gadgets gets more and more as the series goes on as they become more and more explosive in, in many ways. Oh my god, the airbag phone box from GoldenEye has its own card. Brilliant. Absolutely love this. Functions rating, 43%. I mean, that feels undervaluing the gadget. I mean, it did what it said on the tin. Ah, we get the plaster cast missile from GoldenEye 2. Well, there's quite a few GoldenEye gadgets in here. Someone was a GoldenEye fan. I swear to God I didn't have a, a job freelancing um, assigning these cards for this magazine, because I would probably... Just make the whole thing golden eye. Damage caused technology. This is actually a pretty good card. I feel like Q should have just sent bombed out in this. I mean, it certainly causes more damage in the film than the BMW Z3 does. And again, we have another golden eye gadget here, the laser watch, my favorite Bond gadget. Um, and a pretty good card. Technology 91%, cost level 80%. Yeah, no, that's, it, it's solid. It's not going to be unbeatable by any stretch, but it's pretty good. Ah, the Wolfer P99. Oh, okay, this is going to be interesting to compare with the Wolfer PPK. Okay, it's more expensive. Both have the same disguise factor. The Wolfer P99 is 1% tougher than the PPK. Um, t it's more technological, apparently. It's 1% more functional and 3% more damage caused. So, yeah, I guess the P99 was Bond's gun of uh, choice around the time that this magazine was being released, so it makes sense that as the new gun on the block, they would sort of be bigging up that one as being better than the previous one. Remote control phone from uh, Tomorrow Never Dies. This is pretty cool. Um, technology, 96%. Functions rating, 95%. Disguise factor, 90%. Okay, so this is a... This is a strong card. The CVAC Drill from Tomorrow Never Dies has a disguise factor rating of 36%. More disguisable than the wall for PPK. Oh, inflatable ski suit. I love the picture on this card. That's, um, yeah, that's pretty funny. Okay, so inflatable ski suit. Toughness, 89%. Well, it does withstand an avalanche, so that's pretty accurate uh yeah but a, a fairly average card okay x-ray glasses uh disguise factor 82 percent technology 89 percent damage caused 33 percent it causes no damage i mean unless there's like a deleted scene that none of us have ever been privy to where bond sort of like god i don't even know what you could do you 
sort of gives it to a, a goon who tries to put the glasses on and then he nudges them so they poke themselves in the eye with it. But yeah, 33% damage. Oh, I love that Zukovsky's walking stick gun gets, uh, gets a card. And a pretty alright one, surprisingly. Disguise factor's good, toughness is good. Um, I mean, if anything, actually, I think the disguise factor should be higher than that, considering he manages to go an entire film carrying this cane and no one thinks otherwise about it until the very end. I think it is a pretty good surprise, actually, that he um, ends up with that with that, uh, with that walking stick gun. Okay, so that was surprisingly... There isn't, like, one card that kind of, you know, uh, one card to rule them all, as it were. I am, however, curious to know what is the best in... Oh, wow, I didn't actually... Uh, notice this on the Sea drill, but 99% cost level for that thing. So, okay, the Sea drill is the most expensive gadget in all of Bond, which is interesting. Disguise factor... We have, so far, remote control phone at 90%. There are a lot of very good disguisable gadgets, actually. Oh my god, if... If, if the most disguisable Bond gadget is going to be the Poisoned Butterfly, I just... Wait, okay, no, Golden Gun 97%, and the Attaché case, I remember... Oh no, that's only 91%. Huh, so the Golden Gun is the most disguisable gadget in all of Bond? Followed by the Poisoned Butterfly. Okay, so next up we have Toughness. Uh, I mean, I think the C-Vac drill at 94% might actually... I actually end up getting this as well. If the CVAC drill is the strongest card in this set, I will be kind of flabbergasted for a relatively... I mean, it does have a bearing on the plot, that particular gadget, but it's just so... Huh. Uh, God, it is? Yeah? CVAC drill. The most expensive and the toughest of Bond gadgets. That isn't actually owned by Bond. Okay, well, technology then. Um, okay, we've got... 89% for the x-ray glasses, 96% for the remote control phone. Yeah, remote control phone it is, 96%. Okay, next we have functions rating. Um, the remote control phone actually has a pretty good functions rating of 95%. Oh, nope, the functions rating is beaten by the uh, the attaché case from, for your, uh, from Russia With Love. Right, so next we have damage caused, which we've already got a 92% here with Zvac drill. 95% with the Ghetto Blaster. Okay, yeah, it's going to be the exploding bottles from the Living Daylights. What an odd... Just double-checking that it is, in fact, that. I think it will be. Yep, it is. Okay. We have a really odd assortment of cards here for the uh, winning categories. Okay, so Sivak Drill for cost level and toughness. Golden Gun for disguise factor. Q Branch for functions. Exploding bottles for damage caused, and remote control phone from Tomorrow Never Dies for technology. So, of these five, the, of the five best cards in this particular set, Bond only owned two of them, Q only invented two of them. So, I think this goes to show that um, Q's uh, work is actually undervalued and not as good as whoever the villains have working as their tech guys. That's the thing, actually, we never actually know who makes the golden gun. Like, Scaramanga is not very technologically savvy. He's kind of, you know, all the Solex agitator stuff is kind of beyond him. So I wonder who his Q is. I wonder if it's Knickknack. Okay, that's it for Q branch gadgets. Oh, it's raining quite heavily outside. So if that's picked up on the microphone, it's, it's rain. I'm not sat here peeing on the floor. Okay, so vehicles. Let's see what we have here. Okay, I'm quite intrigued actually about this category. I feel like the more recent vehicles at the time of this um, magazine's release are going to be some of the higher ranking ones, but I suppose we'll see. Okay, so we have the Dragon Tank from Dr. No. Um, <laughs> the categories we have, okay, this is interesting. Speed rating, gadgets, cost factor, size, handling, and defense level. Interesting categories. I find size quite a peculiar one. Um, I guess bigger is better. Okay, so we have, yeah, defense level for the tank is 93%. I feel like that should be a little bit bigger. Um, gadgets, 58%. Yeah, I guess it's just got a flamethrower and um, 
Yeah, size and look. Okay, it's a uh, yeah, fairly average card to to get us started, and a very not average card next with the Aston Martin DB5, which is surprisingly not all that great. So the best category we have is gadgets with 95%. Huh, interesting. Size rating 50%. I feel like this size rating is a bit unfair because I feel like there's going to be some cards that uh, should be really good that are actually sort of, uh, you know, done a bad one by just being a normal sized car. Okay, but yeah, gadgets at 95% makes sense. Defense level, handling, yeah, cool. It's a good job there isn't a uh, comfort rating, because M in Skyfall would give the Aston Martin a 0%. Okay, Rolls-Royce next for uh, for Goldfinger. Um, yeah, fairly average card. Huh, interesting that the Aston Martin DB5 has a higher cost factor than the Rolls-Royce. Again, I don't know if that's just value for money or if that's actual um, expense. Um... But either way, more uh, the Rolls-Royce and the Aston Martin DB5 have a greater cost factor than a tank. Okay, so we have Goldfinger's Lockheed Jetstar. Speed rating, 92% is very good. That's going to be probably a contender for um, best of the speed, I think. Ah, next, Fiona's bike from Thunderball. Uh, handling, 91%. Speed rating, 88%. That's, yeah, not a bad... Not a bad card at all. The Disco Volante, which you can see on the back of the card for some strange reason. The uh, image on the front of the card is just Bond and uh, with Largo pointing the gun at Bond and Connery's incredibly hairy leg taking up probably about one sixth of the frame. Okay, so uh, no, not bad, not great. Cost factor's pretty good. Speed rating's pretty good. I wonder if that speed rating is taking into account how fast it actually goes or how fast it goes when the editing is uh, sped up by about, you know, uh, a good few percent. Ah, little Nelly. Okay, with uh, gadgets at 85%, pretty low. Size 35%, that's probably going to be one of the, um, you know, probably one of the smallest of the vehicles, I think. Handling, 84%. Okay, I mean, it's... Defense level 38%. Yeah, actually, no, this is another fairly average card. Bird 1. Oh, that's interesting. Bird 1 is the um, the spacecraft that Blofeld uses to trap the other uh, spacecraft in Yon Liu Twice. I did not actually know it was called Bird 1. Huh. And not a bad card at all, actually. Speed rating is 94%. That's going to be fairly high for sure. Defense level 90%, cost factor 91%. This is actually a pretty good card. Bird one, huh. Oh, Blofeld's Batho sub from Diamonds Are Forever, fantastic. But a really kind of naff card. This is like the Sheriff Pepper of this category, I think. Handling, 64%. I mean, you know, we never saw him using it properly, so I, yeah, I don't know if that's entirely fair. Double Decker Bus has a size rating of 84%, but not uh, not much else that's uh, of note. Scaramanga's AMC Matador. Okay, here we go. Handling 83%. Okay, it's, it's a, an above average card. Like if you were if you were playing the sort of like the game of this, which is sort of like tops trumps kind of thing, um, you know, you you might think you're onto a, a good card with this. Ah, the Lotus Esprit. Okay, finally, another uh, classic Bond vehicle. Gadgets, 93%. That's really good. That might actually be a contender. I don't know if we've had anything that high for this. Handling's pretty good as well. This is quite a quite a good card, actually. Ah, the Liparus. Huh, okay. Interesting that this comes under the vehicles category rather than rather than the uh, the locations category, which is what we're going to go to next. I mean, I know it's a super tanker. I know that, you know, it can transport you, but then... Some of the other locations that I think we're going to come across uh, for it, so Atlantis, for example, like it does move. So I, yeah, I find it interesting that this is vehicle, whereas, you know, I'm assuming that's going to be in the locations card. Cost factor 98%. Jesus. Okay, well, that's going to be. And size 95%. Defense level 92%. Wow, I did not think the Laparis would be one of the best cards, but yeah, I guess going by those categories. And then we come to the speedboat gondola. Uh, gadgets, 87%, um, 
Yeah, okay, that's a fairly, fairly decent card. The Glastron Speedboat. Okay, gadgets, 89%, speed rating, 86 A fairly middling card. I actually, no, it's not too bad. I mean, three categories in the 50%, three in the 80%, not too bad. Moonraker 5, speed rating, 96 Okay, I mean, I guess that makes sense. It is a, um... Yes, a, a spacecraft cost factor 94%, defense level 92%, very solid card there. The Neptune from For Your Eyes Only, so cost factor 81%. Huh, okay. Um, yeah, it's a fair it's a fair card, pretty pretty alright. The Acro Star. Again, see these size ratings really do um, a disservice to some of the better uh, vehicles in the series. Uh, speed rating 93%, handling 93%. Okay, that's, um, I mean, it's pretty all right, all things considered. The Union Jack Balloon has 2% better gadgets than the Acrostar Mini Jet. I, I somehow don't think so. What, because the Union Jack has like CCTV in it, that, that just nudges it above of a far better vehicle, does it? Defense level 35%. Yeah, I mean, literally all it would take is like, you know, one of those little slingshots and a rock and the thing's coming down. Speed rating 44%. I mean, no, not very few of these things actually go below 30%, I've noticed. I don't feel like we've ever had like a 20% or anything like that. In fact, I don't even know if we've had much in the way of 100%. Um, obviously, Bond's loyalty rating got 100%. Um, was other? I think Blofeld's level of authority had 100%, but other than that, I don't know if we've had 100% in any other category. Okay, Zorin Industries Airship. Okay, speed rating 49%. feel like the speed ratings actually, considering, you know, Stacey Sutton can be running along the ground and the airship can come and, you know, uh, catch up with her and pick her up completely unseen. Um, I feel like, you know, if Disguise Factor was something, you know, uh, in this category, the airship would surely be speeding ahead in that category. Okay, and then we have the Aston Martin Volante from The Living Daylights. Uh, gadgets 94% is good, speed rating 89%, handling 89%, defense 88%, very good card there. Ah, the BMW Z3 Roadster, 91% for gadgets. I love how its best category is in the one that we don't see any of in the actual film. Ideal for a Caribbean spin, this sports car includes missiles and an ejector seat. Not that you see it in the film. Ah, the Russian tank from GoldenEye. Oh, hey, again, GoldenEye has some good representation here. Got another GoldenEye one up next. Defense level 95% for this is pretty good and fairly accurate, I would say. The ICBM character train is how we're calling Trevelyan's train, which is, uh, yeah, interesting. Um, defense level 97%. That's, yeah, that's pretty impressive. Ah, next, the BMW 750iL. Okay, gadgets 98%. Okay, I think we might have a winner in the gadget category. Speed rating's good, handling's Good, defense level's good. Yeah, pretty good card there. Ah, oh, for the BMW R1200 motorcycle, we have a handling rating of 97%. That is not bad at all. Ah, we have the stealth ship. Oh, wow, well, this is a really good card. 95% cost factor, 95% defense. 87% size, yeah, surprisingly good one. Again, Tomorrow Never Dies. I remember the Elliot Carver card actually had, it was pretty good in Villains, wasn't it? So I think, and, and Waylands actually, whoever, yeah, assigned these ratings is almost definitely a big fan of that film. Ah, uh, the Q-Boat handling, 96%, very good. Gadgets, 91%. There are a lot of strong cards in those categories in this set. The BMW Z8, again, very good, speed rating 91%, handling 94 And we finish, uh, not with a bang, but with a whimper, with the Parahawk from The World Is Not Enough, which, uh, yeah, got good handling, but um, aside from that, not much else going for it. Okay, so time to find out which the best in each category is. Okay, so we have Moonraker 5 is the fastest of Bond vehicles and one of the best cards in, in this pack, I think. Then for, yeah, cost factor and size, we have the Laparus. 
For gadgets, we have the BMW 750i L. Defense, the GoldenEye train, and handling, we have the motorcycle from Tomorrow Never Dies. Huh. Again, interesting assortment there. The Tomorrow Never Dies bias of this uh, entire card set really is um, sort of... I, we're coming up to locations now, um, and I'm wondering if we're going to have Carver's Media Center as, like, you know, the be-all and end-all Bond villain <laughs> location. Okay, here we go. The final category of the 007 Spy Files 007 Fact Cards is locations. And we begin with Crab Key, appropriately. Okay, well, this is a pretty good card. Um, okay, so the categories we have here are Secrecy Factor, Fortification, Technology, Occupancy Level. Why is that like how many people can live there? Building Costs and action factor. So I guess that's how much action takes place at that location. But yeah, Crab Key's really good. Secrecy, 91% feels appropriate. 94% um, for action, 86% building costs. Um, yeah, I mean, the, its worst category is fortification with 75%, which makes sense considering that Bond and Quarrel could just like get on the island with like a little dinghy. But yeah, pretty good card to start us off. Okay, next up we have the Spectre Training School, which even more secret than Crab Key, apparently, so that's interesting. And more occupancy level, which, yeah, I guess makes sense. Okay, next up we have Auric Enterprises, which is a fairly average card. Occupancy level 63%. Yeah, wow, okay, people live there? Oh, hey, how are you doing? Where do you live? Oh, yeah, that, you know, that smelting plant, I live there. Fort Knox Fortification, 97%. Okay, I think we have a, a winner in that category. Secrecy Factor, 32%. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Everyone kind of knows that it's there. Shrublands. Shrublands from Thunderball has a card. And wow, this is actually a really bad card. Fortification, 30%. Yeah, I mean, there's no fortification. Like, wh what's fortification? Like, they'll have a receptionist, and will they even have security at this health spa? I, I somehow don't think so. Okay, and next we have Palmyra, which is uh, Largo's luxury estate in the Bahamas from Thunderball. Um, okay, another fairly sort of disappointing card with... Funnily enough, a, a lower technology rating than Shrublands. I found that quite interesting. Um, I guess that rack machine that they put Bond on in Thunderball really upped <laughs> Shrublands' uh, technological capacity. Ooh, okay, Volcano Lair, now we're talking. Secrecy Factor, 99%, that's incredible. Fortification, 91%, and then Action Factor, 95%. Its lowest score is Technology with 79%, and I feel like that's doing it a disservice. It's got a friggin' monorail, and spacecraft can take off from it. Like, how, Jesus, how, you know, how technologically advanced do you have to be to excel in this game? Ah, Piz Gloria, 96% very good, 93% very good. Um, not quite up to the standard of the volcano layer, but still pretty good all the same. Draco's estate has a, a card which is uh, interesting. Um, I guess, yeah, this Portuguese mansion is the setting for 007's wedding to Tracy Di Vincenzo, so I guess that makes sense. I mean, building cost, it does all right, but otherwise a fairly poor card, really. Oh, the ba Baha Oil Rig uh, is quite a not bad card. I don't think it's going to be a winner in any of these categories, but it does have a good secrecy rating, fortification, and action factor. Ah, the Crocodile Farm. Awesome. I, get, I keep getting little memories sort of flood back from looking at these cards. I seem to remember that Crocodile Farm was one of the first cards that I got um, in my first issue of this. Fortification 94% that's brilliant. For all of, you know, Blofeld's bar heart, um, security, you know, men with armed weapon, you know, armed with weapons, all that kind of stuff. You just can't beat some good old-fashioned crocodiles to fortify your farm. So that's pretty good. And then we have Dr. Kananga's lair uh, from Live and Let Die, which is pretty good. Secrecy, fortification, action factor. I guess all the villains lairs are going to have good uh, ratings in those three categories. Oh, no, actually. Oh, yeah, Skyrimanga's House of Fun is not a terribly good card. Technology is quite low. I would have thought it, but you know, he's got a lot of tricks in that, in that House of Fun. I would have put that a bit bigger. Ah, now we're talking Atlantis. Secrecy factor 98%, technology 95%, building cost 92%, action factor 85%. Very solid card there. 
The Amazon Temple HQ from Moonraker is a above average card, not terribly secrecy factor. Again, is very good, technology is good, but um, again, it's not going to be winning any categories, but pretty good. Whereas, Jesus, the space station is going to be winning a a hell of a lot of categories. Secrecy factor 99%, fortification 92, technology 94, occupancy 92, building cost 98, and action factor 85. Okay, I think this is one of the strongest cards in the game, never mind this category. I like in the description it says, the home for Hugo Drax's Master Race includes a space radar jamming device, like of all of the features that this thing has, like lasers and these fantastic rooms, you're gonna focus on the uh, radar jamming device, really, as the major selling point. That's, uh, that's interesting. Ooh, Shenzhou's Monastery is a fairly middling card. Fortification's pretty good, action factor's pretty good, but nothing to write home about. I feel like after the space station, this is kind of, like, nothing is gonna come that close, is it? Uh, yeah, the Monsoon Palace, again, it's like, yeah, fairly okay. The Eiffel Tower, I, uh, wow, okay, a real life location, <laughs> um, just thrown in. Um, okay, building costs, 78%, secrecy factor, 30%, secrecy factor, 30%, for those, yeah, those 30% of people that do not know that, like, go to Paris and then see this giant iron sculpture and they're like, oh, wow, I never saw that coming. Building cost 78%, yeah, fairly middling card. Oh, we're with Golden Gate Bridge. Okay, now we're just running through popular world landmarks. Um, again, secrecy factor 30%, pretty good. I, I, good as in uh, funny, I think, not good. It's certainly not gonna be winning um, any categories. Brad Whittaker's HQ has a fairly good fortification, but nothing much beyond that. Ooh, the Oh god, I can never, I never know how to pronounce this, this does not roll off the tongue. Olympatech, Olympatech, the Olympatech Center. Um, it's a pretty alright card. That's fairly good, actually. Um, good secrecy factor, yeah, pretty good. Oh, the um, Archangel Factory from Goldeneye has a good fortification, good action factor, yeah, not bad at all, Servanaya base, again, this card's a little bit scuffed up, I wonder if this was one that I traded with a friend for, because obviously all the cards that I, you know, had, uh, you know, pristine conditions, um, right, 87% for the Servanaya base, that's fairly, fairly alright, uh, fortification, 91% for the Yanis headquarters, action factor, 92%, that's Fair, not fantastic. The printing works from Tonight More Never Dies gets a card, okay. Building cost, 86%. Really, that that just costs ever so slightly less than the Yanis headquarters in GoldenEye. Yes, yeah, so a printing press is just marginally less expensive than building an entire technological center underneath a giant dome which emerges from water. Right, and then we have our ah, Waylin's Armory, which has a pretty good secrecy factor, good technology, yeah, pretty good. Caviar Factory, secrecy factor 91%. I don't think the Caviar Factory is a secret necessarily, but that's a, yeah, quite a good rating all the same. Action factor 88%, very good. And then we have Maiden's Tower. Huh, interestingly, in the font on this card, the percentage symbol is bigger than others. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm obsessing over minutiae here, but I just find that quite interesting. There's obviously a error in the printing of this. Oh wow, we end the set with MI6 headquarters. I would have thought that had come at the start. Um, or maybe this is just specifically the MI6 that we see from GoldenEye onwards, I think it seems to be. Um, technology 92%, occupancy level 97%, that's pretty good. Um, yeah, okay, that's a fairly solid card. Okay, so scrolling through these, I have a feeling that the Moonraker base is going to win quite a few of these categories. Yeah, okay, so secrecy factor, it has 99%. One of the others had 99%, didn't it? It was at the Volcano Lair. So I think we might actually, ladies and gentlemen, have a tie, and we do secrecy factor 90 Nine percent. Okay, so fortification. We have ninety-two percent with the space station. Um, 
I don't know if that's gonna be beaten. Oh wait, the Archangel factory from Goldeneye has 93% fortification. Huh? Oh, oh, nope, the Crocodile Farm, 94%. Okay, I will love it if the Crocodile Farm wins a category. Oh no, Fort Knox, 97% gets fortification. Yeah, makes sense, but I would have just loved the... I would have loved the Crocodile Farm to get some uh, appreciation. Right, so next up we have Technology, 94%. On the Moonraker base. Oh no, hang on a minute. Atlantis is 95 on the technology front. Atlantis wins for technology. Okay, so occupancy level. We have 92 on Moonraker, but I think, yeah, MI6 has 97. Yep, okay, MI6 headquarters wins a category for occupancy levels. Right, building costs. Okay, so Moonraker we have 98%. That can't be beaten, surely. Nope, that is it. Moonraker wins with building costs. Okay, for action factor, we have a very strong 95% on the table for the volcano layer. Oh, we also got 95% for Maiden's Tower, which doesn't seem entirely accurate. Huh? Action factor is tied between Maiden's Tower and the volcano layer. Huh. Okay, so of these cards, I think it is, you know, Volcano Lair and the Space Station are the strongest. I think the Space Station is probably the strongest overall card in this set, um, but it wins in two categories, tied in one, and the Volcano Lair is tied in two categories. So, very strong cards and makes sense, two of the best Bond bases in the entire series. I guess it makes sense that Fort Knox would get Fortification and Atlantis, you know, doing well. MI6 Headquarters does well, but Maiden's Tower for Action Factor. I do not think that more action happens there than in Moonraker, for example, who has an Action Factor of 85%. So, there we go. That is it for the 007 Spy Files uh, card game. So, there are also some other cards in the set which are Joker cards. Um, and I believe there was two in each set. Um, for some reason, I've only got one Joker ally and one Joker uh, location. Both of them have, have images from uh, The World Is Not Enough. Both are sort of, like, shiny. This was kind of like, you know, you have your shiny Pokemon cards. I guess you have your shiny Bond cards as well. So these were just kind of, you know, um, you may play this Joker once during a game. Show it after all the players have declared their scores. A Joker lets you claim all the cards... Uh, from that round, it can only be beaten by another player using a Joker. So it's basically like, yeah, it, I mean, it, it is a, a Joker. It just kind of wins. Um, and some of them have some, like, you know, nice pictures. Winton Kid get one in um, the villains category, which is quite nice. But yeah, I just, I kind of like, it sort of looks like they almost cover, like, they use a tanker from um, License to Kill. So it's kind of almost like they're using, uh, you know, gadgets that, didn't quite... Or Elements, sorry, I was just said Gadgets. I was looking at the Q branch cards. But then this one's the Grenade Pen. I don't know what the logic is behind the pictures that they include in these cards. Um, but yeah, interesting, all the same. Did anyone have the, or the other um, Joker cards for allies and locations? I would be quite curious to know, like, what images were displayed on the other ones. So if you did have these cards please do let me know in the comment section below. Also in the comment section below, feel free to let me know your thoughts on some of these ratings. Um, personally, I found some of them to be quite bizarre. Um, but like I say, it is interesting to just see how official, officially designated sort of, uh, you know, things like this are uh, rated and viewed and that kind of stuff. So I, I found it interesting to revisit these. and I hope that you've enjoyed these couple of videos. Um, please do head below to check out my various social media links if you care to do so. So there is my Facebook page and my Twitter page and my Patreon page as well. Um, a bunch of people support this channel um, through that site and their uh, kindness and generosity is forever just appreciated and it's really very, yeah, it's very, very, very kind of people and that support really does galvanize me to to, you know, make these videos and this content, and it's stuff that I really enjoy doing, so it's, um, yeah, it's, it's cool, thank you very much. And until next time, Bond fans, so long for now.